Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with P featured guest, Peter Rashuti. Peter, are you ready to join the mission? <laughs> yes, I'm enlisting. Yes. Yes, you didn't know it, but now you're in it. Here we okay, go. Well, let me introduce you to the audience. Ready to share. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Peter is a graduate of Babson College and began his career with the investment firm of Kidder Peabody in Boston. He later managed Louisiana's $3 billion investment portfolio while serving as the assistant state treasurer. From Memphis to Mars, Pennsylvania, Peter has addressed more than 1,200 groups in 47 states and several countries. He's been featured in Barings, Barons, Kipling, Kipling, Kiplingers, gosh, I don't say that word anymore. I remember hearing it a lot in America in the old days. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. He also hosts a popular weekly business show on National Public Radio in New Orleans called Out to Lunch. Peter, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Well, uh, you know, having taught so many years, I've taught for 37 years at Tulane University. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny about teaching. You, you really have to get it yourself to be able to, to tell, tell it to someone else. And um, it's been just wonderful. We've sent uh, 1,100 students from the program, uh, Birkenard Reports, uh, out to uh, works, in, works in the investment business. So, uh, and of course, they get a job and then they throw the rope back over and help the existing students. So it's been fun. I think hanging around with young people is... Um, is just like psychic income. It keeps you young. <laughs> psychic income. I love that. Um, yeah, it's so awesome to tap into their energy and excitement. It's just so raw. You know, they got it. And all you got to do is provide the framework for them or the, you know, the process a little bit, and then they can run with that. Maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Birkin Road and what that is, because I know for my listeners, they hear a lot about my teaching and valuation and stuff like that. But I think this is really interesting. Well, uh, 30 years ago, I started Birkenberg Reports at Tulane, and it's we a program where it's a, it's a class. We meet Tuesday and Thursday, and it's a program in which I take 200 students, break them up into teams of five, and each team is responsible for writing a 30, 40-page investment research report with models and all that uh, about a small, underfollowed company in the Deep South, uh, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, pretty much the financial center of this country, and uh, not true. <laughs> and, uh, um, we think that's where the bargains are. And one of the things they do is they we fly them out and they spend a day with the uh, CEO and CFO and uh, visit company sites. We've taken them to, we've taken helicopters to offshore oil rigs. We've been to steel mills. We've been to uh, chicken processing plants. If you've never been to a chicken processing plant, do take the family. That's a nice outing. And, uh, <laughs> so we, uh, and uh, the students really, uh, they get to, use what they've been taught in maybe the uh, freshman and sophomore years and really put it to work. And it's, it's just, you know, this generation um, is, you know, they're very short-term oriented and they, they view companies as ticker symbols. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. you fly out there and you meet Bob, the CEO and Alice, the CFO, and they're the ones making the decision. And it just changes, uh, changes everything. The other thing I make them do is I make them for the front of the report to come up with a 12 month target price, which to this generation is just incredulous you know they can't even believe i'm asking this and uh, i had one student tell me he goes 12 months he goes that's like three girlfriends from now so, it's, <laughs> yeah, so uh, we should only all be so lucky oh i know i know and you know the radio show i do i bring in two entrepreneurs every week and between the, and that and um and being with the students you know i'm the most optimistic guy in town so see that kind of energy and yeah, you know, I'm a big boy. I know some of these things aren't going to work out, but uh, it's, it's great to hear. Um, let me, let me ask you a question just because I've been teaching valuation for so long also, and in a, you know, in different ways, but what, what have you improved or learned over those periods about that program and about what works for them <clears throat> as far as learning, you know, 
how to understand companies, how to analyze companies. I'm curious, you know, what what's changed for you guys in the way you well, teach? Well, a couple of things. You know, I think um, just in general, uh, teaching with uh, anecdotal teaching is really kind of sticks with them. I see students 30 years later, and they still remember some crazy story I, I put to uh, put to the idea. A couple of things that have changed is we now have a section on ESG. Not very involved, really. Just to ask them what have, what have you done in that area in the last couple mm -hmm. of years? You know, what do you got in the sound sound sandbox going forward? Uh, and sustain um, under sustainability, we also have succession, which is not the U.S. TV show. It's the idea that um, you know, uh, you know, Judy's a great CEO, but who's where's the bench strength? What's going to happen if something happens to her? We ought, regionally, I always tell them, what if they're hit by a Mardi Gras float? You know, something mm -hmm. like. <laughs> is it going to happen? But um, that's what we want to know. And I think after COVID, a lot of investors have asked us about that. You know, it's uh, I guess we've all realized our mortality, if, if nothing, mm. if nothing else. But uh, and then we also give them about eight different uh, valuation methods. And they just kind of decide when they're writing the report, which one's the most relevant and how to weight them. We kind of put them on this big line like a football field. And uh, that's their call. Um, mm. And I think the other thing is to try to explain things that you wouldn't know unless you were in this business, like um, really understand cyclicality, seasonality, um, it, you know, meeting expectations for, for, for earnings. Uh, it really starts to come home to them. It really does. And, um, and you know, we always, uh, we always go out and make sure we uh, uh, go out and really meet these, these management there. And I think the thing that gets them is um, they're humans. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you keep thinking there's just, there's a guy with a magic bullet out there and they're just written, measuring risk versus return like the rest of us. And how many companies are in that kind of universe in the Southern states? I'm just curious, like, cause I, I never even thought about that, but when I watch your video of what you guys are doing on the, on the, the site, which I'll put a, a link in here to that Birken road stuff too, so that people can go to it. But um, how many companies roughly are in that universe? Uh, we, we have 20 in the fall and 20 in the spring and they don't change unless they're, uh, bought out or find themselves in tough financial condition, or maybe we were too honest on the report, something, yeah. something like that. But we've had uh, 59 companies bought out since we started. And, you know, the average premium for small caps, I guess, like 35%. And uh, so it, that part's really, really worked out. I think we find a lot of great companies and shine a light on them. And, and then somebody comes and, and buys them out. But uh, um, it's, it's been really something to watch it. I mean, this, I, the, the big advantage that we have versus 30 years ago, Andrew, and this sounds crazy, mm. is that so many small cap companies have no coverage whatsoever on the street. Yeah. And um, you go in there, I mean, I'm only half jokingly, you know, we're driving up and they got a big sign, welcome Birken Road analysts. And it's like, Bob, get the donuts. You know, nobody's been here for five years. And they're not that they're bad companies, you know, yeah. uh, Wall Street is only going to send somebody down unless they think there's going to be a, uh, an offering or secondary or bond deal, you know, you get somebody in New York making $500,000 a year. You're not going to just send them down to home of Louisiana. And of course I have the advantage where I just put them in a car and uh, getting some moon pies and Dr. Peppers and, and we're gone. So it's uh, the only disadvantage we have, because sometimes I'll talk to people on wall street and they're going like, that's man, that's like cheating, you know, that you don't pay them. And there's all these stuff, but we do have a hundred percent turnover. <laughs> so mm, that, there you so. go. That's my only real, really difficult part. Um, one other question about the companies. I mean, a lot of times smaller companies uh, don't aren't very comfortable sharing a lot of information about their business. They're not used to that and stuff like that. How do you handle that in this case? Yeah, you know, what I really remember is when Reg FD came through and uh, they kind of established that you can't be having these conversations with analysts at a, at a bar or something like that. And so it was interesting, the big companies uh, that had big New York attorneys they told them the exact um, exact what you could say and what you couldn't say. But when you got to the small companies, they were really divided because they didn't know if they could say nothing or they could just blab away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember we had one guy, one company, I was talking to the CEO and I was telling them that the students have two models. They got a dollar for next year and they got a dollar 20. And he goes, he goes, a uh, dollar 20. And I said, yeah. And he says, warmer. And I said, like warmer, colder. He goes, yeah, give me another number. I'm thinking you definitely go to jail for this. This isn't, this isn't right. And um, then we visited another company that was basically, you know, shut the windows and the doors and everything when they saw analysts coming. Uh, in fact, I had a funny story in that I had a student 
this is why I'm telling you this story, is mm. his father, is, his parents were ambassadors in Africa. And so what I'm getting at is he was very polite. He was very, you know, he really knew what to say. And so at the end of the meeting with management, he said, this is, you know, really at that period in, in the 90s, he said, uh, well, I just want to thank you for your insight today. And the guy went crazy. He goes, let's get one thing straight. You got no insight. It was like, no, I was just being polite. You know, I was just so yeah, it has been, it has been all of the board. Now the small companies, I think kind of know what they, what they can do and what they can't. We have a conference every year and um, we make sure that all those uh, presentations are taped and go straight to their website. Cause right. that's, you know, if you say something accidentally and, mm. um, but uh, yeah, no. And then we sit with, basically we have companies that can move, you can move the needle on something, you know, it's yeah. uh, if they found some oil or they came up with a breakthrough drug uh, trying to get lost in the sauce at Exxon or Pfizer, but you know it's a game changer for these people. And is there a relationship between the work that these students do and their recommendations? I mean, a lot of times I know as an analyst, you know, you can work really, really hard and think you got it nailed, and then you know you find out, nope, I was wrong. Uh, and have you ever? Uh, do you have any fund, or have you ever thought about do we track the performance of these recommendations, or where are you at with that? You know, it's so funny, Andrew, for 20 years, we had a fund. It was the Birken Road Fund. It traded as a HHBUX, and one of the local banks ran it. They used our research, and they managed the portfolio. So we weren't, there was a little bit of space between us, because mm. my original idea was to have us manage the portfolio. And I, I spoke to the university's attorneys, and once I was able to get them to put the gun back in the drawer, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was like way too much risk. And so we did that. For 20 years, and over that time, the fund outperformed 82% of the nation's uh, equity mutual funds. And then they just got out of the mutual fund business, which is kind of a tough place to make money these days. Yeah. And uh, But it certainly worked. It uh, You know, they made the final call. But, um, you know, we, we look at a lot of balance sheet issues. You know, I, we've never been clobbered by anything, uh, never really been blindsided because we, we understand companies who have a lot of debt coming due soon and things like that, that are just on the horizon. Mm. But uh, it's in, we have a, it's a very expensive program. We have uh, another professor and three staff and uh, 12 different students that had taken the program before that, that uh, helped run it. And it's, it's a million dollars a year. So it's not, um, it's, uh, but it's become our flagship. So it, uh, we were named the uh, number one experiential learning program in the world uh, a couple of years ago. So that's incredible. Uh, it, it paid off. It's yeah. been a lot of fun though. Well done. Well, as someone that's tried to learn finance all my life and tried to be a better analyst and try to be a better teacher of it, I really, you know, appreciate what you've done. Before we move on to the big question, maybe just tell <clears throat> the audience about what's the premise behind Out to Lunch. Oh, the premise behind Out to Lunch is that after Katrina, which, you know, wiped out the city, we had, you know, 80% of the city was flooded. Um, we also we got to start again, and all we became the number one city in the country for young entrepreneurs, and because they had a blank slate here, and mm -hmm. you know Boston's cool, New York's cool, San Francisco's cool, but they're very expensive cities to live in, and New Orleans is super cool, and it's not that expensive, so they they all moved here, and I just wanted to. Get, it seemed like outside of the of the state, people knew what was going on, but mm -hmm. inside. You know, people were just, you know, preoccupied by the negatives all the time, the way, way people are. And I finally, and so I decided to, that we have to do something about it. But what finally pushed me over the top, Andrew, was I went to a friend's birthday party and his father was there. And he comes up to me because he knew what I did. And he goes, uh, hey, Peter, he goes, uh, and Exxon moved. I said, yes, sir. That was 1982. We need to move on. You know, it, and I thought with the radio show and, and friends I had, this is true for Bert, too, people that like me that's great. What are you going to do the second week? You know, because we only have one Fortune 500 company here, Entergy, the utility. But um, we had lots of smaller companies. Uh, we had one company, uh, and this is what we call Stocks Under Rocks. There was a company that had just gone public just to the North Shore of New Orleans called Pool Corporation. It's a P-O-O-L. And it was a, a split adjust. It was about 73 cents a share. And up until this most recent, uh, up until a year ago, it got to $550 a share. Mm -hmm. And what they were is just a classic example. They, they, they host swimming pool equipment and you couldn't come up with anything more boring. You know, it's, you know, if you went to a party, a cocktail party and somebody asked what you were buying and you told them a swimming pool equipment wholesaler, 
you know, they'll be like, I'm going to freshen my drink. I'll be right back. And, you know, you never see them again. So um, they had things that, like the students would like some wild tech company. They're really, mm-hmm. they're meat and potatoes companies. And uh, and we can understand them. Right. Like that's the Fantastic. <clears throat> well, you've got your hands in a lot of different stuff. It's really interesting to learn about you. And uh, now it's time to share your worst <laughs> investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to and then tell us your story. <laughs> That's absolutely right. I tell my students, I say, meet a money manager, I tell you they really have not had any big losers. Just run because it's part of the game. Um, it was, this was over Years ago, I was uh, in Boston with the investment firm, McKitter Peabody, uh, that no longer exists, but it was a wonderful firm. And I started, we had a store recommended called Minnetonka. And what Minnetonka did is they made what we see now as soft soap, the, the little thing you see next to the sink in a, in a kitchen or a bathroom. And, uh, and it was going to replace the bar of soap, which it basically did. But the company itself, the stock was trading around $19 a share. And I think if I was to look at the thing that killed me is that I fell in love with the stock. I I got lots of signals, I mean, really blatant signals that this was not going to work. And I just ignored them because, you know, she was my girlfriend, you know, and I wasn't going to take anything like that. And um, one of the things that happened is that they did grow. Uh, they did very well, but there was no moat around the company. There was, there was no problem for a... Procter and Gamble or anybody to come in and take that business. And so I remember um, I was reading, oh, the stock had now had dropped to like a nine or something. I was kind of beside myself and uh, had it in a lot of clients' accounts as a speculative stock. But I remember Forbes came out and they wrote an article about Minnetonka and they said, anybody could make this with an oar and a bucket. And I thought, wow, okay, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> I got to pull myself together now. And um, And they were absolutely... Absolutely right. And uh, I and then you start making up things just to justify your opinion. Like they have a very particular design on Minnetonka soap. And I was convincing myself that people over time have designed their bathrooms to match the soft soap. And so if somebody else came in, they wouldn't they wouldn't believe. And this is this is stuff you're kind of mind boggling lies you'll tell yourself uh, in, in all of this. And so, you know, I think. Um, you know, one of the things about losing a lot of money in the stock, of course, what a lot of people don't get, but, you know, if you get a stock that goes from 20 to 10, it's a 50% loss, but to get back from 10 to, 10 to 20 is a 100% gain. So you're uh, taking big losses really, uh, really does it to you. And, uh, but I think, uh, I learned, oh, the final blow in this final thing, the stock kept dropping. I was going around trying to build clients by going to uh, Rotaries and Kiwanis clubs and talking about the economy. And then somebody inevitably would ask me, what's your best stock? And I'd give them that. And there's still um, Rotary clubs with dartboards with my picture on it. There's a, it's, um, <laughs> and I'll tell you, the final thing you had when you had a problem with the stock is to just try to run away. And that's, when I did, not in a bad way. I went to Key West for vacation for like four days. Mm. And I thought, I'm just not going to forget. And I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to think about it. And you're not going to believe this story. But I was laying on the beach in Key West in a newspaper. Somebody must have had it. And it blew by me. And I put my hand on it to stop it. And geez, if it wasn't the money section. And I looked and the stock was like I left. I left somewhere was nine and now it was five. You know, I couldn't stop myself looking it up. But uh, it just went on and on. And then when you do that as a broker um, or as an analyst, really, you just blow out your whole clientele. Your institutional salespeople won't believe you anymore. Uh, your clients don't want to hear any more about that kind of thing. So it's very, very, very damaging. But I think if you don't learn from these giant mistakes, there's really something wrong with you, really. It's, uh, I mean, I think it's true with anything, a relationship, anything you gotta walk away with something, a job you didn't like, you know, you've learned a little bit more about yourself. But on investments, um, you know, you should make, there's no question I could go in and make the same kind of mistake, but I wouldn't have as big a position as a percentage of my holdings. Um, I would listen to other people. Uh, I would listen to logic uh, mm. that, that I know now. And, you know, I might have known it then, but once you don't want to hear it, you don't hear it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That's remarkable. How would you summarize the lessons that you learned? I would say the uh, is to once again to 
you know, just the old adage about diversification is, is going to be really important. Uh, the other is just to um, not uh, not fall in love with the stock. Be able to think about it as every day. Would you buy that stock with what what's out now and what you know? And you know, frankly, if I was starting again and I already heard the saw the Forbes article about anybody can make this and and realizing there was no moat, I would if I was looking at it as a fresh position to buy. I think I would have been able to be smarter about it and more realistic. And that's what I think you have to do because, you know, stock prices, when you think about it, they're, the price is the highest price anyone in the world's willing to pay for it. So you have to ask yourself that all the time. But uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm so glad you gave me the opportunity to think about this. It, um, uh, it was, it was kind of interesting to think about it again. And I think with another three weeks of therapy, I'm going to be fine. Yeah, you, you, I think you've come a long way. You, you're almost over it, Peter, for sure. <laughs> Just helping another <laughs> thousand people, and you will be released. <clears throat> um, my my worst investment ever podcast has turned into a little bit of a confessional at times. So I I now fully release you of all. Oh. Thank you, Father. This was yes, really good. Exactly. Um, maybe I'll just review a few things that I learned from what you just said. And that is, the first one is that like, just because a company or a CEO has an idea and they're implementing it well, doesn't mean they can hold on to it. And I think that that's where you can get excited about something. But as you said, if there's no moat to protect someone, now they're, they're, a lot of times students look for a moat and they can be quite critical. A moat doesn't have to be like um, absolute protection. A moat could be the execution. The moat could be the distribution system. The moat could be um, you know, access to certain raw materials or whatever that is. There are many ways to build a moat, but I think it's important to really understand that if you don't have that moat, it could be you could be lucky and run that business and nobody attacks it, but at some point, somebody's going to attack your fortress and without a moat, it's going to be burnt to the ground. And Andrew, I always think of this, when we look at companies to select, we're looking for companies that are, uh, first of all, that uh, they have a good balance sheet, uh, management owns a lot of stock. And one of the things that sounds funny to the students is I want them to have good margins and not outrageously great margins because that just attracts competitors. You know, if you can just stay in a happy little mode, people might not uh, bother with you. Yeah. And if you get confident in the concept of moats, then you can read Genghis Khan and the making of the modern world and understand how he destroyed every village, town, city that was surrounded by a moat also. So, you know, I think it's just the point is, is that, uh, you know, you've got to, you got to think, you know, carefully about it. I think the other thing is uh, I wrote down when you were talking, like making up stuff to confirm your biases, you know, you are going to be in that situation where you are going to be making stuff up to to offset the negative stuff that you see happening. And I know as a sell side analyst, uh, I know all about the loss of credibility from the um, from the sales team and from the client base where they're like, God, you know, you just keep pounding on this thing and it's just so wrong. And <clears throat> I think that that one of the things that I've I've learned over the years, and I remember when I was head of research, analysts would change their mind and they would write a, a report and they would hide it all the way at the bottom that, you know, okay, well, I was wrong and I'm going from a from a buy to a sell. And I'm like, put it up front, put it at the top. You know, exactly. it's refreshing to let go of an idea. And I I I use stop losses for individual stock portfolios. And the, the 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 refreshing nature of going oh well that's out of the portfolio now we can rethink about it absolutely you know and I just don't want to keep looking at it and uh, um, and you know it's it's uh, I think it says a lot about the maturity of the of the analyst as well it's uh, you know in the beginning I can see young people saying I just want to you know bury it so nobody sees it over mm -hmm. there but yeah um, you got to grow you know one of the great things I've done academically is I brought uh, in 2008, I brought 27 students to Omaha, Nebraska to spend the day with Warren Buffett. Mm. And that was that was just amazing. And you know, I do a lot of public speaking and I uh, meet a lot of famous people and some are great and some aren't great the way you would think. But um, we went out there. It was the very bottom in November of uh, 08. Mm. And that was and he, that's the day he wrote an op ed to The New York Times that this is the time of a generation to buy stocks. And uh he was just the warmest, kindest man. He took us to lunch and made us drink cherry cokes because that's what he likes. And um, and uh, 
and he was telling us some, you know, great, great stories, more, uh, really more about life than in the markets. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. It's, I guess it'll sound a little off color, but it's, it's a pretty good story. It's, uh, so it's the end of the world. It's 08 there. And one of the students um, raises his hand. He says, Mr. Buffett, how bad is it on Wall Street right now? And Buffett said, I, it is awful. I've never heard such sad stories. I heard an investment banker left his big office in Manhattan, drove to Long Island to his big home there, met his wife at the doorstep and said, honey, we're going to have to make some changes around here because I don't think I'm going to get a bonus this year and I don't think I'm going to get a bonus next year. And, you know, really, we're going to we're going to have to fire the chef and you're going to have to learn to cook. And she said, well, OK, but you're going to have to learn to make love so we can get rid of the gardener. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're all going to have to make changes around here. Absolutely. That. <clears throat> That's when, I, when I see Buffett on TV, I just think of that joke. <laughs> that that is a great one. We're all going to have to make some changes around here. Um, the, the other thing I was thinking about, uh, when I, 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 I don't have much to say on relationships because I've never been married yet, but people do occasionally mistakenly ask me for relationship advice. And I always say the same thing. And I say, I just going to ask you one question and I just want a yes, no answer, you know, and that's all I'm going to ask. And this is simple and it applies exactly to what you just said earlier and that is this knowing what you know about the person you're dating now knowing what you know which you know a lot more about them than when you first met if that person walked up to you today to start a relationship would you say yes i want to start this or no i don't want to start this and the answer will tell you so much and the answer is liberating and that's really the way we have to look at stocks. And so uh, we have to think about uh, kind of zero-based thinking. Imagine that we don't own this. Would we put it in the portfolio? And I think that, to me, is a big lesson, you know, from what you're, you know, what you shared. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's been a lot of fun. Yep. Um, so let me ask you, what, uh, based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what would be, you know, one action that you recommend a young person take to avoid suffering the same fate? Uh, let's see. I think it would be to um, really, really think of all the downsides before you take a position. Uh, it's so easy. And of course, the company will give it to you too. An analyst sell side research tends to be a little too optimistic. I, you know, I can understand that's how you get up in the morning. And, uh, but I would try to think of all the things that could go wrong and put them down. In fact, I like to take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle and put the, the upside and then all the possible risks in here. And then really be able to look at the two of them before you make a, um, make a decision to buy a stock. Mm, great, great advice. And what is a resource that you'd recommend, a resource of your own or that you've got or any others that you'd recommend for our listeners? You know, I um, believe it or not, was, we had a book fest at two this, this past weekend, and I heard um, David Rubenstein uh, talk about his new book, uh, How to Invest. And he basically had very, and it's, it's great if you have ADD because this chapter is running like 15 pages long, but he talks about, talks about 40 money managers. And I generally don't really get through invest books. And I really read this, uh, you know, from cover to back. And you just hear a lot of um, a lot of similarities are in here. One of the similarities you hear is that most of them didn't come from money. These portfolio managers they uh, they did uh, they did did it on their own, and they have all these different ways to look at things. Mm. Uh, and I, I just I just think it you know I what I'm thinking is that those interviews might have started with you know I'm the master of the universe or whatever, and he let them say that and then cut that out of the interview and then just talked about it and. Um, He's a very funny guy. You know, he's obviously, a, he's a Jewish guy that grew up in Brooklyn. And he told, I'm a big baseball fan. I've been to all 30 major league parks. And uh, and he told when he was growing up, Sandy Koufax was the great Jewish pitcher for the uh, Dodgers. And he said, and I just to give you an idea how I didn't understand anything. He says, I was a big Koufax fan. And when I was seven, I really thought all the major league players were Jewish. And it was like, he was the only one. So, so. <laughs> but he's uh, a really perspective. funny guy. Okay, that's great. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Uh, to get through this current uh, upheaval, um, and I, I think um, uh, 
to try to, what I'm going to, would like to do here is to really dig a little bit deeper because there were stocks that I really liked a couple of years ago that are selling uh, for much lower prices now. Mm. And I really want to relook at them. And, you know, has the story fallen apart or is, um, is so they're down for a reason or is just, this is just uh, the mania of the market moving out of these things. Mm. And uh, I think if you can separate that bunch, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. Now it's lonely, you know, because nobody wants to talk to you about buying stocks or anything, just swimming upstream. But I, I think there's a lot that's been left that uh, it's been hurt that shouldn't be hurt. Yeah. I want to find it. That's exciting. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join the free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Peter, I want to thank you again for joining the mission. And on behalf of ASTOTS Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching <laughs> moment. Yes, there it is. Do you have I'm any parting proud. words? <laughs> Thank you. That I didn't even know I was going to get that recognition. Now I'm into it. You got it. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.